I'm excited to introduce our speakers this morning. To, here to talk to us about the Library of Sparta, we've got David Raymond, Greg Conti, and Tom Ross. Please give them a warm welcome. <clears throat> All right, so good morning. It's kind of loud. <clears throat> so, uh, thanks for being here. We're, uh, it's really our honor to be uh, speaking at Black Hat this year. So uh, the, the Library of Sparta, th this is a term that we use to describe uh, military doctrine and strategy has been refined over hundreds of years and is reflected now in uh, writings by military theorists, in, in doctrinal manuals, and in professional publications and, and various uh, online resources. And what we hope to do today is give you an introduction into this really vast archive of, of uh, military thinking that's been developed over years, and then provide some examples of how you might use it in the defense of, of your network. So uh, standard disclaimer slide, the uh, comments we make are our own thoughts and don't reflect the policies of any of our employers. And just a few words about us. Uh, my name is David Raymond. I'm an associate professor at West Point, uh, and I teach and do security uh, in the area of uh, computer and network defense. Um, I am also a 25-year uh, 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 Army veteran, and uh, I'm an armor officer, so I've spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, applying military doctrine, maneuvering tank forces both uh, in peacetime and in wartime. And I'm Greg Conti. I also teach at West Point um, and, do, and also conduct security and privacy research. Uh, my background, I've been doing that for 14, 15 years. Before that, I did electronic warfare and signals intelligence. And I'm uh, Tom Cross. I'm the director of security research at Landcope, and I've been involved in this community for about 20 years or more. Uh, I also have a little tag on my badge that says that I'm a certified thought leader, uh, so that <laughs> qualifies me to speak here today. Uh, so um, there are uh, a few reasons why we thought that this uh, would be a valuable uh, thing to discuss here at Black Hat. Uh, the first uh, thing is that the internet is increasingly a domain in which um, nation states are engaged in conflict. And that conflict uh, may uh, occur in the form of, of espionage or it may occur in the form of, of actual acts of war. Uh, and unfortunately, um, the, uh, the targets of those uh, acts are not necessarily other nation states. Um, they include uh, private organizations, uh, private corporations, uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, individual activists, and you know, potentially everybody has to contend with this reality. So it's useful to understand how nation states think about uh, and operationalize uh, the things that they do. And so that's the, that's the first um, motivation behind this, this talk. Um, the second is that I think we really got to do something about defense. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the standard assumption of a black hat for uh, uh, you know, many years now has been that the attackers have all the cards with respect to computer security. Uh, and um, you know, people have demonstrated that time and time again on these stages over the years. Uh, um, the, what we call the Library of Sparta is, represents hundreds of years of thinking about uh, um, uh, you know, offense and defense in different situations. And we think that there are insights within that corpus of material that can provide us with new perspectives on the challenges we face in cybersecurity and hopefully lead to uh, insights about defense uh, that, uh, that, can, that can help us uh, you know, deal with the situations that we're now having to contend with. Uh, the third uh, a point that, um, uh, or the third reason we wanted to do this talk is that military jargon and military ideas are uh, finding their way into uh, this community's culture. And this community has a terrible habit of latching on to an oversimplified understanding of something and then literally blasting it everywhere in you know, marketing material. And over time, it gets to the point where people think that this oversimplified understanding that they have is the truth uh, and the people who really understand the background of these things uh, don't know what they're talking about. So, so, um, you, you know, we, we want to talk about some of these military terms and jargon that people are using and, and help people understand the, the, what they really mean and the depth behind them. Uh, and I want to make it clear that, that we're interested in this subject. Um, uh, we, we're very interested in the substance over the style here. We don't care about this because it sounds cool. We care about this because it provides insight. Equally important is to discuss what we're not covering. So there's been a lot of interesting work done on intelligence-based network defense. We're not really going to go there. Uh, and, and what we're trying to provide is, is not just one easy answer, one exploit. What we're talking about is 
really, it's the intersection of new domains where very interesting novel research and ideas can come from. It's the intersection of military doctrine and this thing that is uh, computer network defense, cyberspace operations that can, that can be uh, really employed in the enterprise on the defensive side can be exceptionally powerful. So it's something you can chew on and think about over the next year, and I, I, there's lots of fertile uh, research opportunity. Uh, we're going to come at this mainly from the, uh, the Army doctrine side because that's our background, but equally important and, and equally available is uh, joint military joint doctrine, which is the other services, Navy and Air Force Marines. Uh, and the, finally, uh, we're not going to be providing easy answers uh, because this, we're going to tee up some things that we think have a lot of potential for, uh, for uh, application in this, in this space, but we, it, it, this isn't just a, how, uh, a, like a checklist of things to do. And we promise no Sun Tzu quotes. So uh, what is doctrine? What, doctrine is the collective wisdom of military organizations that's evolved and codified over time. Uh, for some, it's a sacred text. Uh, there are people who read the, you know, you've heard the phrase, by the book. They'll read the manual, they'll memorize the manual, and they'll operate almost in an automaton-like way following the manual. That isn't necessarily the best, uh, the best approach. And, and doctrine, the best doctrine comes from uh, real world experiences and lessons learned uh, that's uh, forward looking and uh, is flexible and can be employed in the future. Uh, the worst doctrine, and this happens and occasionally happens today, it's written in a vacuum uh, and forced upon op operators. So as a result, particularly due to bad doctrine, uh, people don't follow it. Uh, and, and particularly in America, uh, some would argue it's the greatest strength of the U.S. military. And here's a, a, a Soviet-era quote uh, that Americans don't follow their own doctrine. Uh, probably, an, uh, uh, un, it's a bit un, unsubstantiated and a little overstated, but there's something to that. By not rigorously following the book, it can be exceptionally powerful. Uh, and in the 21st century now, we have uh, a wide variety of people helping evolve doctrine. One is Doctrine Man, and he's a uh, uh, rumored to be an army major, yet to be unmasked, and he uh, acts, lampoons and instigates uh, in uh, conversations and dialogues surrounding uh, the evolution of, of, uh, of doctrine. So he's out there, and he usually makes fun of the senior people. So what, what is doctrine, you know, what is the right answer to all this? Well, there's, there's uh, bad doctrine, you can think the Maginot line uh, during World War II, and then uh, the counter, countering it on the opposite side was the, the evolution of Blitzkrieg. And what Blitzkrieg did is it took tanks, and instead of employing them just in a defensive, or in a supporting role, they, they gave them a maneuver role. And what they did was punch through the hard, crunchy outside perimeter and ran amok in the rear area uh, of the defense. So that may sound familiar in, uh, in, in this intersection of conflict. There's uh, lots and lots of, of similarities. So the best doctrine is a evolving and flexible framework that can be applied in a wide variety of situations, often under stress. And importantly, and particularly from the enterprise perspective, uh, it, it's designed to scale. So this is, you know, we're, we're talking about armies here, the fog of war, the slack of information, exactly what we face uh, today in many ways, but it scales all the way up to army size. So that's why we think there's such potential. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so there's a variety of sources of, of uh, military thought and, and doctrinal manuals are but one of those sources. Um, and uh, U.S. military doctrinal manuals, almost all of them are freely available online. So you can, uh, uh, you know, quick Google search will, will uh, lead you down a path to just about any uh, joint or army or, or other service doctrine uh, that you'd care to read. And we'll talk about a couple of those doctrinal manuals uh, in, in a few minutes. But other sources of, of military thought are uh, collective writings of military theorists over the years, and we'll address uh, a couple of those in a minute. We also have uh, a robust online community of military thinkers that really develop doctrine on the fly, right? So just like the IT and the InfoSec communities have this robust online community and professional journals and et cetera, um, you know, military professionals have the same thing, and these, these are where you can find uh, emerging doctrine. 
<clears throat> so um, most U.S. military doctrine is, is really based on the writings of sort of a handful of theorists, uh, mostly from the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, um, two of the probably the most prominent ones are Jomini and Clausewitz, who were uh, European military men, professional thinkers, military theorists who wrote books uh, in the 19th century based largely on things like the Napoleonic Wars and um, these books are still widely read by uh, U.S. military professionals and by uh, military professionals around the world. Uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan was a, a Navy, uh, U.S. naval uh, thinker, theorist, uh, officer, uh, and uh, he really is credited with turning uh, the U.S. into a major sea power in the uh, 19th and 20th centuries. And then uh, uh, pilots like Billy Mitchell and uh, Colonel John Boyd, um, you know, Air Force officers who uh, uh, form the foundation of most uh, current U.S. Air Force doctrine. Uh, really, th these are all rich sources of, of uh, you know, historic thought on how to apply uh, military strategy. So uh, again, we're going to largely address uh, Army doctrine. That's what we're most familiar with. And uh, these are really the cornerstones of U.S. Army doctrine. So if you were to only read one uh, doctrinal manual, it would have to be FM 3.0, the operations manual. That manual describes in detail how the Army um, approaches operations from the strategic, operational, and tactical levels. And it, it really uh, um, uh, is a fairly good manual. Uh, it evolves over the years, so this thing is reprinted every three or four years and, uh, and uh, keeps up with current military thinking. Uh, FM 5.0, the operations process, describes how staffs um, develop and execute Army operations. So it's a staff manual to describe how to, how to approach planning and execution. And then FM 6.0, uh, mission command, that's a, a leader's manual, so it describes to commanders how they should visualize their operational environment and then communicate that vision to their staffs and to their subordinate commanders uh, so they can approach uh, operations the way the commander would like to see it approached. So uh, it's useful if you're going to delve into this world of military doctrine to understand how it's organized and, and where to find what you're looking for. And um, <clears throat> U.S. doctrine is uh, numbered hierarchically based on the uh, Continental Staff Numbering System. And this uh, um, grew out of 18th century European armies. Um, the, the numbering system is shown here, so uh, manuals that are in the one series address uh, manpower and personnel, two series manuals are intelligence manuals, three series manuals are operations, etc. And so, for example, um, the uh, overarching uh, military intelligence manual for the Army is FM 2-0, and then as you traverse your way down into the leaves, leaf nodes of that tree of doctrine, you'll find things like FM 2-91.4, which is a very specific manual about applying uh, the intelligence process to urban operations. <clears throat> so um, again, the three series manuals address operations, and uh, I've listed a few uh, that we think are, are particularly appropriate to this crowd. Uh, um, military uh, um, operations that you might see yourself uh, um, sort of paralleling in, uh, in a network defense sort of a scenario. And uh, these manuals describe how the, the Army synchronizes what they call the six warfighting functions. And uh, so those warfighting functions are listed here, movement, maneuver, command and control, intelligence, fire support, uh, protection, and then sustainment. And those all have analogs uh, in the digital realm that, that uh, I think we'll get to during the, the process of this talk. So doctrine, what, you're, what we're showing you in terms of doctrine is kind of the end state as, it, as it's published and formalized. But ideas come from the force and you put them out there in various forms which Dave highlighted. I just want to show you one example. Uh, the, for those of you familiar with the idea of, or the, the concept of ranger school, Army Ranger School, 61 days long, incredibly intense, uh, very immersive, and one of the hardest schools uh, in the world to teach uh, War fighting. So, uh, what this article uh, suggests is: well, is there a way to instead of uh, war, Ranger School is all about infantry ground tactics? Is there something that's equally demanding? And we're not talking inside the classroom experience, but an immersive 61-day event. Like if you took Ed Scotus's Cyber City, which is a miniature city uh, with real-world uh, components underneath the real systems that can then be attacked. Um, if you combine that with, a, a, say, a full-size uh, mount site, which is military operations on, on urban terrain, um, if you combine that, what, what would it look like? So anyway, this is the type of idea that gets floated out there. 
Uh, this is also the type of idea that, uh, uh, like a moth to a flame, Doctrine Man is there. So. Uh, what, what this is doing is it, he, he puts it out there and, uh, and it generated some feedback. Uh, we can, uh, feedback yeah, no. and it, does it pop up? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, a couple of quotes and what we did is we basically got every smart ass possible answer uh, out of the crowd uh, that you have to write code uh, 19 hours a day with little food and I knew a ranger school would eventually become uh, an online school. Uh, because what we have here, it, it, for those who are familiar with the military, it's run by, or the army, it's run by infantrymen and combat arms officers and uh, they, you know, this is cultural heresy. But this is the first step in getting it out there. So this is being a little facetious, but um, equally we did receive a lot of positive, constructive feedback on the Small Wars Journal site saying, hey, the good and bad points of this idea. Okay, so um, now that we've provided Kind of some insights into the, into this library. Um, what we want to do is um, provide some examples of how military thought has found its way into network defense, and uh, some of those ways are are uh, listed here. And we'll start with uh, this notion of operation security or, or OPSEC. I'm sure um, many folks in this room have, have heard this term used in uh, in the defense of their networks. And um, for the military, the operation operation security is a Process, very systematic process used to um, uh, identify, control, and uh, protect critical information. So the OPSEC process, from a military perspective, is all about information, right? You want to uh, uh, limit vulnerabilities by protecting information about friendly activities. And um, th there's a joint publication uh, on the operation security process. Really, it's a, it's a good document. Describes the, the military's approach, uh, and it's only about 20 pages. Um, so it, it, this would be an easy reference for somebody to go dig up. So of these uh, different doctrinal concepts that we're going to discuss today, OPSEC is probably one of the ones that this community has the best uh, um, understanding of and familiarity with. Uh, but you know, nevertheless, we see a lot of sloppy execution out there, uh, and I wanted to provide a few examples of OPSEC failures. Um, the hallmark of OPSEC is discipline. It's about taking care in everything that you say and everything that you do, uh, that that action uh, does not reveal information to your adversary that you don't want them to reveal unnecessarily. Uh, um, and um, uh, you, you know, often out of convenience or expedience, people do things um, that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, make connections for their adversary that they don't need to make. Uh, so, um, you, you know, often, so first of all, let's think about this from the perspective of an attacker. Often an attacker does not want the defender to know that the attack ever took place. Um, but sometimes that's inevitable. Um, if you're disseminating malware broadly uh, throughout the internet, you know that malware analysts are going to get a hold of it and, and take it apart. Uh, and, and still you see people who are operating large botnets uh, take actions to try to prevent certain pieces of information from falling into the hands of malware analysts. Uh, classically, people use domain generation algorithms in order to protect the location that their command and control um, uh, system is going to pop up in advance. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, as an example of an OPSEC failure in this, in this regard, um, I, I, you know, I, I think Stuxnet uh, applies. Uh, Stuxnet was a very sophisticated malware operation, um, uh, one of the most sophisticated malware operations we've ever seen. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, it was also, uh, uh, you know, a self-reproducing piece of malware, and the people who created it either knew or should have known that it was going to get everywhere, uh, and things that get everywhere have a tendency to get analyzed by, by uh, professional malware analysts. Um, however, um, within the code of Stuxnet, there was some code that was shared uh, with a few other uh, malware families, uh, uh, Dooku, Flame, and Gauss. Uh, and in fact, the analysis of Stuxnet led to the discovery of Dooku and subsequently the discovery of some of these other malware families. So these guys uh, connected something that was uh, you know, broadly targeted uh, with other operations that were, that were narrowly targeted. And so as a consequence, uh, um, you know, some of their operations were compromised. And that, uh, that's an example of a pretty significant OPSEC failure. Uh, Another um, you know, point from the attacker's perspective um, is, uh, is that often the attackers try to prevent defenders from understanding their true identity. Uh, for some reason, uh, people in policy circles uh, tend to think of attribution on the internet as being a technical problem. Every time I'm in Washington, D.C., somebody says, have you guys made any progress on the, or the uh, attribution problem? 
Um, attribution is not a technical problem, and I don't think that it has a technical solution. The way that you attribute actions in cyberspace is by exploiting the OPSEC failures of your adversary. Um, and as an example, uh, you know, uh, just a month ago or so, uh, uh, Operation Tovar uh, took down some of the command and control infrastructure associated with the Game Over Zeus uh, botnet, and they uh, named the, uh, one of the people responsible. Um, the, uh, and it, there's some uh, um, interesting court filings that have been published uh, in this case. They're, they make for interesting reading, and they discuss uh, some of the uh, ways in which this operation was compromised. Um, uh, you know, the guy uh, that they named, uh, it sounds like he accessed his uh, personal email uh, from the same system that he was used, using to operate the botnet, and so that's how they were able to connect him with the botnet operation. So that's a good example of an OPSEC failure from an identity standpoint. And I think that, uh, so there's this guy named the Gruck who has a, a, a deck out there called OPSEC for Hackers, uh, which is an interesting deck to read if you want to think about this uh, attribution stuff uh, from, a, uh, from a, uh, an attacker's perspective. I think that, um, um, you know, the corollary is that a very professionally executed operation is going to be difficult to attribute. Um, and so anybody who says the attribution problem is solved is probably oversimplifying things. Uh, you know, from a defender's perspective, uh, it can be very difficult to, um, uh, to maintain the level of discipline required if you're not an army. Uh, if you work for a private company, um, you know, you, everyone who works in your organization is a civilian, they're not going to engage in the level of discipline that you probably need them to engage in to have the sort of OPSEC that a military would have. Uh, it's just not reasonable. Um, and that creates a variety of problems. There's lots of information uh, that employees of an organization will disseminate on the internet that's valuable to attackers for launching spear phishing attacks. You know, what kind of technology these people work with at work can tell you something about what you need to target. Um, so to provide you with an example of this, uh, I used to work on an IPS product, uh, and we, we, um, we had a lab where we would set up uh, vulnerable software so that we could reproduce exploits um, and validate that our IPS was detecting those attacks. Um, and often, the vulnerabilities we were working with had not been publicly disclosed yet. Uh, and we had a lab team, and their job was to go out and get these vulnerable software packages and get them set up so we could work with them. And, you know, we were asking these guys to set up a different software application every week, and, you know, I don't think they fully understood the context around what we were asking them to do. Uh, and it turned out one of these guys had a Twitter feed. Uh, he's just kind of like blogging about his job. Well, this week they want me to set up an exchange server. Uh, so uh, needless to say, we had to ask him to stop doing that. Um, so, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a company, it, it's difficult to, again, maintain that level of discipline. So. Um, the OPSEC process actually provides a risk management approach that allows you to take a look and identify, uh, uh, you know, key things that, that are of value to you. And as, as, a, as a, a private organization, it makes sense to have a short list of things you really want to protect and focus on protecting those things because you can't protect, protect everything. And what we're trying to do in this talk is just highlight some areas. I mean, like, you're, you're probably not going to find many books on OPSEC, but, the, and the, but this and, a, and about real literally a thousand other subjects, there's actually free books on it that dig into it in, in very mature, mature ways. And one of the things, as you think about this process, if you dig in, you'll find out that there's a, uh, a model already for, for, for doing some of this. Essential elements of friendly information is one piece of that. That's where the commander makes a list of things that they do not want the enemy to know. So if you're running a malware lab, you can make a list of things that you don't want your adversary to know, and you can help then make sure your team is aware, aware of that. Uh, in military context, that, that list could eventually become classified. Those are the things that are, are declared secret so that they won't be really, you know, that they can be under tighter controls. So another point I want to make about this is that in addition to protecting information that could be used to compromise your organization, you probably want to protect uh, or you want to prevent adversaries from knowing how much you know about them. Uh, often, uh, you know, we're all working together uh, um, to uh, uh, fight the same adversaries and information is being shared within this community about those adversaries. Um, and so if you uh, uh, do something to, to reveal to the adversary that you know things about them, like say interact with their command and control server uh, and, and it ends up getting burned, uh, you're not only screwing yourself, you're screwing a whole bunch of other people that are trying to, uh, you know, keep track of the same adversary. So um, there's a real need for, um, you know, more discipline out there within this community with respect to uh, things like information about adversaries. 
So another uh, military concept that's found its way uh, into network defense is this notion of the kill chain, which uh, is really a colloquial term for the U.S. Air Force targeting process uh, developed in the, in the mid-1990s, and it's this series of steps, find, fix, track, target, engage, and assess. So in the find phase, you're identifying potential uh, enemy elements, then you fix them, so identify their exact location, you track their movements and activities, eventually you make some decision that you're going to target that enemy asset, and then uh, you decide how you're going to do it and engage, and then you, you assess the, the quality of uh, your targeting, and then you go back and sort of start all over again. <clears throat> now this uh, concept was uh, translated into cybersecurity terms in a 2010 Lockheed Martin paper that uh, took that same notion of a series of steps required to target an enemy and applies it to the steps that uh, an adversary might take in order to uh, gain unauthorized access to your network. So you start up with the, uh, the reconnaissance phase, weaponization, delivery, et cetera. The idea here is that if you can break any element in that chain, then you can pre prevent the, uh, the, the compromise of your network. I'd, I'd also add that it's, it's very useful for prediction because if you, kn if you know the basic set of steps they're going to go through, you can re almost very reliably know where they're going to go next and start uh, taking that into account. So I, I think that the kill chain is an excellent example of uh, something that came out of military doctrine that has had a lot of influence on the cybersecurity community over the past couple years. Um, and it's not teaching us anything technical uh, that's new, right? It's just giving us a different perspective on the way we think about the problem we're solving. And so that's kind of what we're talking about. Uh, um, so, you know, traditionally, um, uh, the, there's this asymmetry problem in cybersecurity, or we, at least we believe there is, right? So as a defender, I have to identify every vulnerability in my really complicated environment, and I have to block attacks that target um, any of them, uh, whereas the attacker only has to find one vulnerability in order to be successful in compromising my environment. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, the odds favor the attacker. Um, in this uh, kill chain model, when we think about it, um, this attacker is attempting to be covert, and they have to get through every step of a multi-stage process uh, while maintaining that, uh, that uh, OPSEC, if you will. Um, uh, and, and the defender actually has multiple opportunities to be successful at, uh, at stopping the attack. And so it, it's, a, it's a way of thinking about the problem that uh, sheds light on a, a natural advantage that defenders have. Uh, and I think that because we know so much about the advantages that attackers have in computer security, um, you know, we could use to spend some time thinking about what advantages defenders have and how to, how to really utilize them. Okay, so uh, terrain analysis is critical to success, successful uh, military operations, and um, as the military has tried to apply operational concepts to, to, to this new cyber domain, uh, this is one area that uh, we've had some challenges. Uh, in, in fact, in the Army, where we have a de definition for literally everything, there is no definition for cyber terrain. So senior leaders, as they think about this problem, they tend to think of cyber terrain only as those physical systems that allow uh, traffic to move from one place in the network to another. So they'll think in terms of switches and routers and, and uh, network cables. Um, <clears throat> we see uh, um, Cybertrain as a, uh, much broader, obviously, so you start all the way up with the, uh, with the supervisory plane, so those elements that uh, provide command and control to your, uh, to your cyber assets. And then the next level down you have the persona plane, so you have people and you have their online personas, accounts. Uh, there's often a, a one-to-many or many-to-one relationship between those things. Um, next uh, plane down, you have the, uh, the um, logical plane, which is really the top six layers of the OSI model or the top four layers of TCP IP, right? So you have uh, um, operating system software, you have application software, you have the protocols that allow communication be between devices. If you go down another level, this is where you get to those physical devices on the network, uh, uh, routers, switches, cables, and then at the bottom you have the geographic plane, and um, sometimes the, the actual location of the device matters, right? So if you can take out power to a particular area uh, um, where uh, uh, your adversary's network devices are located, then, then uh, the, the actual location is important. So uh, once we... Um, have this broader understanding of cyber terrain, what we can do is we can apply a, a sort of an old standard military process for doing terrain analysis, and that's this, uh, this acronym OCOCA, and you start up at the top there with observation and fields of fire. So think about, uh, as a defender, you can think about your network and how it can, how it can be observed from other locations in the network. So how, can, how is it seen from outside? How is it seen from uh, um, perhaps my customers? How is it seen from my competitors? And all those people may have a different viewpoint on what your uh, network looks like. The next level down, or the next step is uh, cover and concealment. So what can I hide from observation 
through routing protocols or, or VLANs or other uh, network technology. The next level, uh, the next, uh, the O obstacles, how can I make my network harder to attack? So what can I put between an adversary and my network, firewalls, ACLs, uh, IDS, IPS systems, et cetera, those things that can make me uh, uh, more defensible. Uh, um, and then we look at key terrain. So what are those elements of the network that can provide a marked advantage either for me as a defender or for an adversary who's trying to approach my network? And then uh, finally, the A is for avenues of approach. So we're not just thinking of physical pathways into the network, but what are those logical pathways? What are my outward facing services that somebody can gain access to? Uh, uh, can somebody send a phishing email that's gonna cause one of my systems to call out? Um, so we think that, that taking this notion of, of terrain analysis and applying it to, uh, to cyber terrain is a pretty powerful concept. So the, the three of us have uh, collaborated on a number of uh, papers at the International Conference for, uh, or on uh, uh, Conflict in Cyberspace, or CYCON, um, in Estonia. And what the pa uh, we, a paper we published there uh, just recently this year uh, was about uh, key terrain in cyberspace. And we thought about applying the Sokoka model to thinking about a, a computer network. Um, and and uh, you know what insights does that provide you? And it, uh, you know the the analytic process that you go through is actually very similar to what you would do if you were trying to architect your your network to begin with. You'd identify key assets. You'd figure out what the interfaces to those assets were. You'd think about how someone could get access to those interfaces, and you'd sort of do that iteratively until a picture of the of the environment uh, uh, emerges. And it kind of looks like this graph down at the bottom. Um, and the key terrain are nodes that have a high degree of connectivity. Uh, or they are uh, nodes that are closely in close proximity to a key asset. Um, and so, you know, really the insight that emerges from thinking through this um, is that defenders have a tremendous uh, home court advantage with respect to uh, um, uh, network intrusions. Um, you actually get to construct the environment uh, that attackers are attempting to compromise. Um, and uh, you, you know in advance what it consists of. You know where the key assets are, where the key terrain is. Um, the, uh, the attacker has to discover this iteratively through reconnaissance. Um, uh, and, and the problem is that when they're performing that reconnaissance, they don't necessarily know whether or not the things that they're interacting with are real. Um, and as a defender, you can exploit the attacker's lack of knowledge of your environment in order to get them to uh, reveal their presence to you. Um, so, um, I can't see. So this brings us to uh, the subject of, of denial and deception, or battlefield deception. Um, and the definitions we're going to use here are, are not the canonical army definitions for battlefield deception. Uh, we picked a, a different set of definitions that came from a book on counterintelligence. Uh, and the reason for that is that they separate the concepts of denial and deception from each other and, and prompt you to think about them separately. Uh, uh, which I think is valuable. Uh, so d denial um, involves preventing your adversary from learning something which is true or dissimulating the truth uh, so that your adversary doesn't learn it. Uh, and deception uh, has to do with um, inducing your adversary to believe something which is not true uh, or simulating things which are, which are, which are false. So probably the classic example of military deception is uh, Operation Quicksilver during World War II when uh, General George Patton was put in, in charge of a mock army across the English Channel from Calais. Uh, um, mock army complete with rubber tanks, you know, fake trucks, fake supply depots, all kinds of radio traffic. Of course, uh, Patton was pretty pissed to be put in charge of this fake army and not in charge of the actual invasion force, but it really set the stage for, for successful invasion in Normandy and, uh, and Patton was able to make up for it later on. <laughs> So um, uh, th there is actually a talk at Black Hat tomorrow uh, called uh, uh, The Devil Does Not Exist, which talks about deception in, in cybersecurity. It could be an interesting follow-on from what we're talking about. It seems like from their abstract, they're focused a lot on uh, deception from, a, uh, from an attacker's perspective. Um, I, I think that there's um, a lot to be said for deception from a defender's perspective, and um, there is uh, not a, enough of that going on operationally. People have talked about honeypots for years, uh, but typically when you think of a honeypot, it's something that's sitting out on the internet and it's really capturing attackers who are sort of scanning the entire net internet and opportunistically breaking into everything that they find. Um, and uh, those kinds of threat actors aren't very interesting to me. Uh, however, I think that there's, there's other roles for honeypots to play, um, particularly inside your environment, behind your perimeter. Um, if an attacker gets into your environment and you haven't detected them, uh, what they're going to do is try to find, find key assets, cyber key train within your environment, uh, and if you can place things there uh, that aren't really there or aren't uh, actually operationally used, um, they may uh, interact with those things and that may prompt you to uh, realize that they're there. 
Uh, and it's really important to emphasize that you can place deceptive objects at each one of the cyberspace planes that uh, Dave uh, defined earlier. Um, we're not just talking about network devices or services. We're also talking about identities and, and data and things like that. Um, all of those things could potentially be canaries that can, uh, uh, that can identify uh, someone rooting around in your environment. And, and I would add that in addition to deception, what, we, what you can do is employ obstacles of various shapes and forms at those, at those different levels. Uh, and that the adversary then will try potentially to hop from level to level where, okay, there's bar physical security, there's barbed wire around the command post, they fit, hop to another level and come back in another way. So kind of like Mr. Spock with his multi-level chess set, you can go from level to level to perform attacks. So it's, it's quite interesting, I think. So, um, uh, you know, to, to sort of underline this point, we talk a lot about how the human is the weakest link in your security program. You could have all your technical P's and Q's, uh, uh, um, you know, lined up, and, and uh, you, you know, some idiot in your organization is going to click on a link or, or uh, they're going to be, uh, uh, you know, social engineered over the telephone. So, um, you know, we think of a lot about that, uh, uh, you know, as a weakness of defenders, but what about thinking about that as a weakness of attackers? Anyone who's attacking your environment is ultimately human. Uh, and so if you can exploit that human, if you can cause them to believe things that aren't true, if you can prevent them from understanding what's really happening, uh, um, you know, then, then uh, you, you, can, you can offset the balance against them. And uh, you know, that's not something that we, uh, I, I think, talk about enough in, in computer security. So another subject that I think that this, org or this community has an oversimplified understanding of is, is uh, threat intelligence. If you're gonna, if you're gonna uh, um, you know, exploit the human behind the attacks that are being targeted against you, you need to understand that human first. So I, what we're seeing, for better or worse, is a, an evolution or a really adoption uh, in the private space of military techniques and, and strategies. And often for good reason, because people are fending off nation state class adversaries. Uh, one of the things you see is uh, this idea of threat intelligence, uh, but it's, it's really much more than, say, malware hashes, uh, known malicious domains or IP addresses. I mean, those are just like the raw pieces of information that feed into a larger uh, intelligent um, analysis effort, perhaps uh, inside an, a, an organization or between large organizations. Uh, and then, you know, beyond this level, you start, we've seen some really powerful reports have come out that have made, really made nationwide uh, news, international news about threat actors. So you see those reports. And it, so going above, you know, this raw data to those reports, but there's, there's actually much more. And if, for, if you're involved with threat intelligence, you absolutely have to take a look at these doctrinal manuals because they're really thoughtful and they're really deep. And there's this whole lifetime profession of that is intelligence analysis that you can draw from and help make your stuff better. I mean, there's tremendous business uh, potential uh, there. Uh, really the goal of, uh, of intelligence analysis is to get into the head of your adversary, almost this uh, empathy with them, that you can then be predictive. You can know what their true capabilities are, not what they state they are, because oftentimes there's a, there's a big disconnect and you really need to be aware, uh, aware of what they're capable of doing, what their incentives are, and building long-term uh, area expertise that allows you to be a, a true subject matter expert. That's, that's your objective, and these books uh, will help, uh, help get you there. Uh, at the highest level, uh, the intelligence cycle is how, how this is done. That there, it's, a, it's a mature process, it begins with the mission of an organization and the questions that need to be answered. So a, a, collection, a collection plan is formed where those, uh, requ those needs, informational needs can be gathered in a variety of ways. Ideally, you're going to task your lowest, uh, your assets, intelligence collection assets first. Uh, and if you don't have the capability, then you can ask a larger organization to try and help. And you think this feeds up the chain and up to, say, national level uh, intelligence uh, activities. After the information is collected, it's, it's fed back in, and uh, initial uh, uh, analysis, uh, well, processing and uh, initial markup is done, and then um, it's, if, it, if, it's, if it's in a time-sensitive situation, that can be forwarded. If there's more time, additional analysis will be performed, and then it's disseminated. Uh, importantly, there's an evaluation feedback built in, so you can determine how effective this is, how reliable the source has been over time, and so on. And here I just want to give you uh, some, some metrics of what good intelligence, how you evaluate good intelligence. So when you, uh, 
when you're trying to evaluate the products, if you're buying threat intelligence or you're trying to produce it, uh, these are the types of ways you can do it. Um, you know, is it relevant? Is it predictive? Is it tailored to the to needs of a given organization? Or just three examples. Uh, another phrase that's used a lot is the idea of techniques or tactics, techniques, and procedures (TTPs). Uh, so what we have here are the pr precise military definitions. Um, the tactics being how you employ forces, uh, often uh, think teams in relation to or organizations or teams in relation to each other. And then you have this concept of techniques, which are really higher level methods uh, for performing missions. And then procedures, which are the step by step processes. Uh, in this community, you'll uh, uh, sometimes hear the term tools, tactics, and procedures. And that's okay, uh, but I think it's, if, if, that's, is, if that's something you're dealing with, it would be great value to see how the, the military has thought about this and maybe it can help improve, uh, improve what you do and adopt it and, and, uh, and modify it for your own needs. And I find this uh, particularly interesting. Uh, really, the whole motivation came uh, for this talk came from uh, Nick LeVay, and we uh, we were just Tom and I were uh, discussing. Um, he, he was he was defending um, a, a major DC think tank, and you know was dealing with all the actors that you're you're, you're facing. And the question you have that he, he faced is, do I shut down this server or this you know this network device or whatever, or and, and lock out the adversary, or do I uh, continue to monitor and gain additional information, right? And he's like, I, you know, are you wrestling with that? And I said, oh, that's called in intelligence gain loss calculus. And he's like, I, didn't, I don't even have words for this. The community does not have words for this. So, so what you'll gain, I think, are concepts that have been refined. So the idea of do, do, do you watch or do you shut down? and that that can be an organizational process, something you should think about, not necessarily only in crisis, you should think about that in advance. What's our general procedure? Who should be the people involved in making that decision? Um, so, uh, you know, just as a rule of thumb, and this is somewhat counterintuitive, but the more you know about an adversary, uh, the greater the risk of allowing them to continue to, to proceed within your environment. If you don't know anything, then there's a great opportunity to learn by allowing them to, to proceed. Uh, but uh, you know, the more you learn, there's a diminishing return associated with continuing to learn more. Uh, but the risk remains there. Uh, and in fact, it, it can be useful to define in advance uh, what are the different kinds of things that you're looking to learn uh, by allowing them to proceed uh, so that you can line up the, the, the information you're collecting and, and uh, evaluate uh, where you're at versus uh, uh, you know, what's going on in real time. So another uh, military concept that's found its way into network defense is this notion of the OODA loop, or observe, orient, decide, and act. Uh, this is a, a um, process that was developed by Air Force Colonel John Boyd, uh, who was a Korean War pilot, uh, and he uh, used this idea of getting inside your adversary's decision cycle, right? So make quick decisions faster than your adversary, and by doing so, you can get inside his decision cycle, get inside his OODA loop, and you can win. Uh, he, he originally developed this in, in uh, the context of aerial dogfights, but later um, he really applied this across uh, um, Air Force doctrine. And um, it's interesting, a lot of people get this idea of OODA wrong. So they think that what OODA means is making quick decisions to, to get your uh, um, adversary off balance so that he can't decide what to do next. Really, uh, what Boyd did was he used this notion of the OODA loop to drive training, right? So he uh, felt that um, it was important not only to make quick decisions, but to make the right decision quickly. And the way you do that is you uh, train your pilots and uh, um, you make them understand what the adversary's uh, potential actions are, and then based on that, you can have a shorter menu of potential reactions, and then uh, over years of training, you can, you can train your pilots to make correct decisions quickly, and, and this is a pretty powerful concept that uh, um, extends past aerial dogfights into other uh, areas. And, and I'd add to that, for the, the looking at the range of potential options open to an adversary, if you go out and look at attack trees, attack graphs, that's exactly what it's doing. So I think there's an important connection between uh, the, the idea of a OODA loop with uh, attack trees. So the, the OODA loop is, is very relevant when you're thinking about operating in an environment where there's an, an actor that's, that's doing things within your network. 
Um, so the question is, you know, how quickly can that actor uh, observe, um, you know, orient, decide, and act within your environment versus how quickly can you do that? How well can you observe what's happening within your environment? Uh, and, and then how uh, quickly can you, can you uh, change what you're doing in order to react to uh, things that are happening? Uh, and often, you know, uh, the answer is that you're doing a vulnerability scan of your network once a month. Uh, and if you find a vulnerability, it takes you two weeks to patch it. Uh, and so that, that's sort of, that you're not spinning your OODA loop very quickly if that's, your, uh, if that's your operational stance. But that's the reality in a lot of organizations. Your, um, your attacker can, can pivot around uh, much more quickly than that. Um, I, I think that uh, um, you know, the OODA loop has a lot of relevance to thinking about incident response. We talk to incident responders about um, making sure that they've laid the groundwork for what they're going to do in advance. They've had conversations with people in the organization in advance um, so that people, can, people know what to do in the event that there's actually a, a situation that's occurring. And that's very similar to uh, sort of the discussion about making sure that you've, you've thought through uh, before you get in a dogfight all of the different scenarios that could occur so that you can just take those actions without having to figure out what they consist of. Okay, so targeting is an area that, that uh, is, is just beginning to find its way into uh, this idea of cyber operations and cybersecurity. So targeting is, is uh, based on effects that a, a commander wants to achieve. So for example, an effect might be that uh, the commander wants to uh, um, degrade an adversary's command and control systems. There are a variety of different ways that the staff could select uh, to, to potentially cause that degradation. They could send in a team to kill the commander, they could drop a bomb on the operations center, they could uh, destroy power generation so that uh, uh, the physical systems just won't operate, uh, they could uh, jam frequencies. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of approaches, uh, but uh, the approach is, is uh, selected based on the, 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 the effect in the end that the commander wants to achieve. And it's another one of these military, very systematic processes that, that uh, the, the, the Army is good at. So um, how does this apply to cyber operations? Well, uh, um, as militaries around the world are uh, um, developing their uh, cyber operations forces, uh, they're finding ways to use uh, perhaps network attack or defense uh, either to um, replace some kinetic activity or to uh, uh, you know, execute in conjunction with kinetic activity. And here's some examples. Uh, um, in 2007, uh, uh, Israel is suspected to have used a cyber attack to cause uh, Syrian air defense systems to go offline. And uh, the, the, result was there, the, the result was that Israeli pilots were able to fly freely into Syria. Um, that was in, reportedly, right? In, reportedly. Yeah. In uh, 2008, um, when the Russians attacked into Georgia, there was this corresponding uh, di distributed denial of service attack on uh, network systems in the country of Georgia. And uh, so those, some of those attacks are suspected to have uh, originated in Russia. And uh, so here's this po possibility of a coordinated cyber and physical attack. And then we have uh, the Stuxnet virus in 2010, which uh, we think might have been uh, created in order to take some uh, Iranian centrifuges offline. Of course, that, could, that same effect could have been achieved through a massive bombing campaign, but uh, um, you know, when we can select non-lethal means to achieve an end, sometimes that's preferred to some lethal means. So a um, couple other things we'll, we'll hit real quick. I think we're going to get uh, the hook here before too long. Um, military operational planning cycle. This is a, a, another, so again, uh, the, the U.S. Army, U.S. military is very good at these systematic processes, and sometimes systematic is good, right? If you can, if you can have a system, a process in place that you can use to, uh, you know, achieve some end uh, that's repeatable and that you can train your security staff to, uh, um, then, uh, you know, in the end that can be very helpful. Uh, what you have to do, though, is you have to be careful not to stifle creative thinking and, and prevent people from, from sort of thinking of creative solutions. This is the military uh, operational planning cycle, and uh, if you sort of hold it up next to the engineering design process, which uh, many of folks in here are probably familiar with, it, it looks very similar. <clears throat> Uh, another uh, doctrinal concept that's fairly new uh, um, that, that uh, might be leveraged in this space is this notion of design. So this design was um, uh, a doctrinal concept developed uh, just over about the last 10 years, and it developed because um, operations in Iraq and Afghanistan early on were not going very well, right? So we had these insurgencies, and the uh, typical military solution, uh, you know, originally, to an insurgency is you kill as many insurgents as fast as you can, and it uh, turns out that that wasn't solving the problem at all. In fact, it was making it worse. It was just 
making, you know, pissing people off and creating more insurgents. So then uh, uh, the military went back to the drawing board and, and developed this notion of design not only to think about more creative solutions to the problem but to really think about the problem. So are we, are we even solving the right problem? And uh, so this has led to some uh, pretty, uh, to, to some better approaches both in Iraq and Afghanistan that, that uh, have taken us to where we are now. So I've done work in uh, security visualization and uh, I just wanted to point this out to you. The, the military is all about providing a oper common operating picture, understanding what the battlefield looks like and they've done it for many, many years. There's an entire book of graphics and symbology uh, that if, if any of you are trying to depict networks and conflict in, in any of those planes, take a look at this document. It's a whole book out there and there's a lot of great ideas. <clears throat> okay, so um, just uh, to, to sort of wrap it up, uh, um, the slides here provide a pretty extensive list of uh, more resources. So, so we list uh, places where you can find military doctrine, uh, some uh, interesting uh, books uh, that by some of the early military theorists. Uh, there are some great publications out there, um, lots, lots of stuff to be had. And um, these slides I'm sure eventually will find their way to the uh, Black Hat website. And then we have, there's also a corresponding white paper that has uh, these references and, and many more. I, I uh, forgot to mention that my boss TK Kiani has a 40 minute video on YouTube about the OODA loop and cybersecurity that's pretty good. I meant to put that out there. It's worth, it's worth watching. Okay, so um, we're at the question slide and I don't know if we have question time or Okay. Uh, okay. We're gonna, folks, we'll, we'll go outside. If, if you guys have questions, uh, we'll be happy to answer them. We'll, we'll try to like go outside. Oh, we have one question we, for that. We do have, I'm going to ask uh, for, for uh, one question. That is, um, so we have a prize. So in the spirit of Black Hat, we have a prize that, that you can win. If you can identify the missing symbol. Anybody know what the missing symbol is? What word? What's that? <laughs> Raise your hand. your winner. Raise your hand. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> come on down after we'll give it to you. All right. So we'll, we're happy to talk to you out, outside. Uh, th <coughs> thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>